Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I am uh, Muhammad Kalim Rahman, host for the webinar today. Welcome all attendees and Ramadan Kareem. This is our uh, fourth webinar in the year uh, 2022, in the month of April. And uh, today also we have a very interesting topic which is application of computational fluid dynamics CFD in building performance simulation. And uh, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Muhammad Al-Haji Muhammad from Architectural Engineering Department. So uh, this webinar is organized by RCCBM and facilitated by KIX and uh, as, as for all our webinars, all attendees will be muted throughout the presentation. And uh, from the very beginning, you can type in your question in the question box, and uh, which will be answered at the end of the presentation. And if you have any comments, uh, uh, depending upon how many questions are coming in, uh, you can raise your hand and we can ask the question directly also. And uh, at the end of the seminar, webinar, you will get a mail regarding the uh, survey on this event. So please uh, uh, give some time and try to uh, fill the uh, survey form. So I said that IRCCBM has got uh, five different themes, materials for sustainable construction, assessment and monitoring, modeling, innovative techniques, environmental health of the well. And one of the most important topic is also energy conservations in buildings and uh, the Grand Challenge project in that respect is also uh, going to start very soon. And uh, let me start the proceedings by first uh, uh, welcoming our speaker, Dr. Muhammad Al-Haji Muhammad, and uh, just a brief uh, Resume of Dr. Muhammad is Dr. Muhammad is a BTEC architecture from in architectural engineering, and he did his MSc in architectural engineering in 2011. His BTEC was from Abu Bakr Tafwa Baliva University, Pauchi, and MS from King Fahd University of Petroleum and Minerals. And then in 2015, he completed his PhD from uh, Newcastle University, UK, with the topic of uh, natural ventilation and an evaluation of strategies for improving indoor air quality in hospitals located in semi arid climates. He taught at Ramat Political Madaguri and Bayuri University, Kano, and currently serving as an assistant professor in architectural engineering department at KFUPM. His main research interests include indoor environmental quality, ventilation and indoor air quality in buildings, computational fluid dynamics, and energy simulation of building materials and systems, energy efficient and sustainable building design, building system, systems evaluation, and full scale uh, measurements techniques. And uh, with that introduction, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Muhammad Al Haji Muhammad. To start his presentation, I will stop sharing. And Dr. Muhammad, you can. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kalim, uh, for your introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah, thank you very much once again. Uh, today I will be presenting uh, a webinar on the topic, uh, the application of uh, computational fluid dynamic uh, CFD in building performance simulation. I will look at uh, the introduction of building performance simulation. I will look at the application of CFD uh, to the building performance assessment or uh, simulation. And we'll also uh, look at the best practice guidelines for uh, this uh, application. 
Uh, without wasting uh, much of your time, I will start with uh, introducing what building performance simulation means. BPS or building performance simulation uh, is the replication of aspect of building performance using a computer-based uh, mathematical model created on the basis of fundamental physical principles and sound engineering practices. Always testing buildings uh, physically, uh, especially in full scale level is very difficult and it has a lot of cost constraints and also uh, flexibility constraints. So that's why building performance simulations are very, very good instruments that uh, uh, helping in research work, especially uh, in replicating or mimicking building phenomena, uh, different building phenomena. The objective of building performance simulation is to quantify the aspect of building performance that are relevant to design, construction, operation, and control of buildings. So building performance simulation uh, does not only uh, stop at uh, the design stage, it also, uh, there are simulations that are related to design, there are, are simulations that are related to uh, building, construction, uh, operation, and at the same time, different controls, uh, in indoor control, outdoor control, climatic controls, uh, different controls that are applicable to building. Building performance simulation has various subdomains. Uh, it has uh, divided into different aspects. The most prominent uh, in this aspect include energy simulation. One of the major building performance simulation that we conduct actually in the field of uh, building is energy simulation. Uh, the second one is thermal and heat transfer simulation. In the energy simulation usually will simulate at the building level, uh, we simulate at the component or system level. Sometimes we simulate HVAC system, uh, or we simulate also the building level, building itself in terms of space and so on to see how uh, it conserves uh, energy. We also uh, uh, simulate thermal and heat transfer. Uh, this is actually applicable to building and at the same time, uh, systems and materials. Sometimes we simulate individual materials like uh, 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 building envelope, for example, component uh, like insulations and so on. And sometimes we actually simulate the entire system, which is combination of different elements that made up a system. We also use uh, building performance simulation or apply building performance simulation in lighting simulation. Uh, different lighting aspect also uh, used, oh, and, and also acoustic uh, noise control in buildings and so on. One of the major also important uh, simulation in building performance is also uh, ventilation and air quality in buildings. This is very important, especially this has to do with the fluid uh, dynamic as well, because ventilation and air quality is one of the major CFD uh, applications that we use in built environment. Another major important aspect is contaminant transport. Contaminant transport, outdoor contaminant transport, indoor contaminant transport, coupled contaminant transport, and different contaminant transport in duct of HVAC systems and so on are also a very important phenomenon that we also use for simulation. Also fire spread in buildings. We also use uh, uh, building performance simulation to simulate fire spread uh, in buildings. Uh, this are uh, some actually, there are so many applications, perhaps we cannot mention all of them here, but these are some of the most prominent applications that uses uh, building uh, uh, simulation actually uh, to, for assessment and evaluation. Th those, uh, those that are colored in red are the ones that directly use computational fluid dynamics, CFD simulation, like thermal and heat transfer, acoustic ventilation and air quality, contaminant transport and fire spread. This actually directly, we can simulate it using uh, CFD simulation. Uh, energy simulation also use CFD, but that is coupled with uh, uh, some other energy softwares uh, like design filters and so on, uh, because some, of, some also energy software have capability of computational fluid dynamic simulation, while some energy softwares uh, stand alone energy softwares, which requires uh, data from the CFD simulation to run the energy uh, simulation. Then we come here to computational fluid dynamic. CFD 
or computational fluid dynamic modeling is based on the principle of loop mechanics, utilizing numerical method and algorithm to solve problems that involve fluid flow. So whatever problem in buildings or engineering that involve fluid flow actually can utilize CFD. CFD as the most sophisticated air flow modeling method can simultaneously predict air flow, heat transfer, and contaminant transportation in, in and around building. So you can uh, predict contaminant transport, heat transfer, air flow around both inside and outside the building. It pro provides valuable information related to safety in dispersion of toxic gases in complex environment either in outdoor environments such as in urban areas with multiple obstacles and building structures or in indoor environment with complex uh, flow directions. Some, several commercial softwares or programs exist uh, for CFD simulation. Some of them, some like ANSYS uh, Fluent. Uh, we have seen scale uh, CFD. We have often form uh, SOLIDWORKS, uh, COMSOL also. These commercial softwares are divided into two actually major non -com, sorry, uh, commercial are mainly uh, closed uh, source softwares because uh, you have to subscribe and you have to pay. Uh, we also have like open form, we have some open, uh, open source softwares that are for free, but such kind of software they have, they don't have a very good graphics user interface that can, uh, that one can be able to actually use it very easily in a friendly manner. So one has to get a knowledge of uh, uh, programming language actually for, to impute uh, information and get uh, results out of this kind of softwares. They are free, they are very powerful uh, in fact, but they have limitations in terms of uh, graphics user interface. The majority of these CFD programs are based on the solutions of Nadia Stokes uh, equations. Uh, Nadia Stokes equations, as you know, is, uh, it contains uh, the continuity equation. It's a combination of uh, equations containing uh, the continuity equations, uh, the momentum equations, x, y, z equations, uh, the energy equations, and so on. The numerical uh, solution of these equations in two and three dimension has been applied to flow problems ranging from diffusion to objects to several phenomena in buildings. This actually uh, diagram shows the typical uh, uh, CFD governance equation, the Nadia stock equations. Uh, you can see the continuity equation on the top. You can see the uh, three momentum equations, X, Y, Z, and also the energy equations. Um, you can see the Reynolds stresses uh, in bracket by the right of, the, uh, of this. Uh, we have nine uh, uh, actually uh, relationships and uh, six of them are unknown. So this is what uh, the CFD simulation usually uh, uh, tries to sort of iterate, you know, uh, so many times to actually, uh, until it gets in convergence uh, before uh, we eventually get outcome or output or results from this kind of software. Turb uh, predicting turbulence model. One of the major aspects of a CFD simulation is it uses uh, uh, the turbulence model actually to predict uh, phenomenon. Turbulent flow uh, is one of the unresolved problems of classical physics up to now. Despite many years of intensive research, a complete understanding of turbulent flow has not yet been attained. Several methods of predicting turbulent flow exist uh, in CFD, uh, but the three most popular approaches so applic applicable to building performance and other engineering simulations are DNS direct numerical simulation. We have uh, large eddy simulation, which is LES, and we also have the RANS, uh, Reynolds Average Navier Stock uh, Simulations. There are a lot, but these are the most prominent and most useful uh, in terms of uh, simulation, in terms of application. Uh, when, when we talk of the direct numerical simulation or di DNS, this is actually type of uh, turbulence uh, flow that solve the exact Navier Stock equation completely. It doesn't approximate any or model anything it solves uh, both the large and small eddies, everything is solved. 
all vortices and eddies are soluble. Nothing is modeled. It is exact, actually. One of the major issues with uh, DNS or direct numerical simulation is very time consuming uh, because it requires a very huge computational resources because it doesn't approximate, uh, it doesn't model, it actually sort of uh, the entire uh, uh, navier stock equation completely. Uh, only very simple geometry could be solved and because it requires a huge uh, amount of data. So uh, in direct numerical simulation or DNS, we cannot be able to uh, simulate a very big, uh, a very big buildings or very big phenomenon that require huge uh, cells and huge nodes and huge discretizations, you know, a huge uh, mesh and so on. We only, we can be able to uh, simulate only uh, small things that require very less, uh, space. So this is, uh, uh, but the outcome or the result of the direct numerical simulation is exact and is the, uh, uh, is very accurate uh, compared to the other two simulations that we will discuss is the most accurate one. The second uh, uh, type of turbulent mode uh, flow also is uh, LES, which is large uh, eddy simulations. In this, in the last a large eddy simulation, uh, it solved the filtered navier stock, the so called uh, filtered navier stock equation, actually. So, uh, in this case, only the large edges are being solved. The small ones are modified. So, it filter out all the small, uh, small edges and then it solved the large edges. This is what the uh, LES does, actually. So, it is uh, not exact, uh, perhaps like the DNS, it's not, ex uh, it's not exact. Uh, but less computational power demanding compared to the direct numerical simulation because it doesn't solve the uh, small edges or vortices. It actually approximates and model the small edges while solving only the large edges within the domain or the volume. So that is why in LES or large edge simulation, uh, we actually uh, we cannot get uh, exact result in terms of reliability. And we can also, uh, uh, the computational needs or requirement also is less compared to direct numerical simulation. The third uh, most prominent one actually uh, is more prominent than both the direct numerical simulation and large edge simulation LES, uh, because uh, almost 90% of CFD users use RANS, uh, renal average Navier stock actually. Uh, simulation. So the RANS actually solve average Navier stock equations. Only the mean flow is solved. All edges are modeled. So in this case, uh, uh, for the RANS or Reynolds average Navier stock, it only solve, uh, solve the, uh, the mean uh, actually uh, flow, uh, but it's approximate and model both large and small edges. Not exact, just like the LES, uh, compared to DNS, uh, less accurate, uh, because uh, uh, LES is more accurate than uh, RANS, and also uh, DNS is more accurate than LES, but generally applicable, because uh, we can be able to use our normal personal computer at times uh, to uh, simulate uh, phenomenon when we are using RAM simulation, because uh, it has, uh, it doesn't require huge computational uh, uh, power uh, compare resources uh, compared to DNS and also uh, large edge simulation LES. In the RANS, uh, RANS approach, the effect of turbulence on the mean flow is also uh, model. So these are the three uh, major turbulent uh, flow that we use in CFD uh, simulation. To actually sum of uh, uh, these three uh, ways of predicting turbulent flow, the direct numerical simulation DNS, we solve all edges as we said, and it is exact, and we approximate or model nothing uh, because we have solved everything. But in case of a large edge simulation and runs Reynolds average Navier stock simulation, uh, we are actually solving part of it. For example, uh, uh, in, in LES, we are solving only the large edges and we approximate the small edges. Um, in RANS, uh, we, are, uh, we, we are solving uh, average flow only and we are approximating both, both uh, small and large edges. That is why 
Uh, they, this too actually requires turbulence models, uh, turbulence model actually, uh, to actually uh, for for for, uh, for the simulation. So uh, when it comes to tur turbulence model, uh, turbulence models are additional equations that allow obtaining an estimate for the Reynolds stress in RAS equations. Because here we are actually, uh, uh, we are approximating. So because of the approximation, we need actually uh, the, uh, the turbulence model uh, to estimate for the Reynolds stresses that I showed from the left when I show you the uh, the general governing equation of the Navier stock equations. Uh, several types of turbulence models exist, uh, especially in commercial software. We have a lot of uh, turbulence models. Uh, we have a mixing length model. We have a spallet Almaraz model. Uh, we have a K epsilon turbulence model. Uh, there are three different. Uh, types of uh, K epsilon, we have the standard K epsilon, uh, renormalizable group, and then the realizable group K epsilon. We have also K omega uh, turbulence uh, model. We have al al algebraic stress model, uh, and also Reynolds stress, uh, uh, Reynolds stress model. So most of these uh, uh, turbulence model are selected based on what we uh, want to achieve with the simulations. For example, so for example, some of them are very poor in uh, treating near wall treatment. How would you uh, to treat uh, the phenomenon near the boundaries actually of the wall, for example, then, when we are talking about buildings. The wall treatment uh, is the set of near wall modeling assumptions for each turbulence model. So uh, when we are selecting uh, turbulence model actually, especially for LES or uh, RANS simulations, we need to see uh, our interest in the simulation. Is near wall phenomenon very important for our simulation or not important for our simulation? Some of these uh, soft turbulence models really are very poor in replicating or uh, uh, modeling near wall uh, uh, treatment in terms of uh, fluid uh, flow or fluid uh, dynamics. So that is why a selection of any of these. Uh, this uh, turbulence model depends on how we actually want to model our near wall treatment and also uh, our uh, wall functions, which are equations empirically derived and used to satisfy the physics in the near wall uh, region of the uh, whatever space or volume that we want to we want to simulate. CFD simulations actually in uh, built environment is applied in different scales. We apply CFD simulation in meso scale, uh, which is uh, length less than 20 kilometers above uh, ground. We also up, um, apply CFD uh, to micro scale, which is uh, L less than two kilometers uh, above the ground. We also, uh, at the building scale, around 100 meters uh, L. And also, we also uh, apply CFD to building component scale, just like a 10 meters. So this building component scale are different components actually that we have in buildings, uh, like uh, wall component, like a roof component, like a hedgeback system as a component. Um, a flow component, the envelope itself, the shell of the building, uh, different aspects. So these are actually at the component scale. So we can also apply uh, CFD at the component scale. Lastly, also we apply CFD at the building material scale. We can be able to simulate individual materials, for example, insulation material. We can be able to simulate different insulation material in terms of the heat transfer, in terms of the other fluid characteristics. So these are scales that we use uh, all the time to uh, sim simulate. And CFD can be able to simulate uh, in any of such scales. If you look at this, this is actually the, C uh, the process of CFD simulation in buildings. If, if you look at this uh, chart, uh, usually the CFD simulation starts with creating a geometric model. Uh, different CFD software, they have uh, tools to create this geometry. 
but we can also create geometry using the normal CAD software like AutoCAD or ArchiCAD or Revit, uh, Rhino, from the SketchUp, whatever CAD software, and import it into uh, CFD simulation uh, with the product data. After we must have uh, successfully created our data, uh, don't forget, uh, usually, if there are very complex issues in buildings or in the model that we create, uh, simplification is very important. The more you simplify, the more the simulation will become actually practically possible in terms of computational needs and so on. So we need to simplify as much as possible. We only cannot simplify if the simplification will affect the outcome of the simulation, the result of the simulation. But if the simplification will not affect the outcome or result of the simulation, then we need to simplify the model so that we can be able to strike a balance between the computational power and the reliability and validity of the results or outcome that we receive from the CFD simulation. So the second uh, uh, stage is uh, grid generation. We need to actually mesh the, uh, because CFD simulation uses actually cells and nodes that you actually created within this volume uh, of fluids that you created uh, to calculate uh, the phenomenon. So that is why we need to create this mesh. We need to generate this mesh. Uh, we, again, we have also different uh, uh, software that will uh, generate mesh. We have standalone software to generate mesh like Harpoon. We also have uh, uh, mesh generation software in, uh, in, integrated into different CFD software like ANSYS uh, Fluent and so on, or ANSYS Mesh and so on. After grid generation, then now we need to set the solution parameters. We need to set different parameters that we want to solve, actually. We, do we want to solve energy? Do we want to solve pa 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 particulate matters or pollutant and dispersion? Uh, what type of... Uh, then we need to uh, set the uh, turbulence model, as I said, whether it is K-epsilon, the K-omega, uh, spalat almaras model, whatever turbulence model that we want to... Uh, uh, setting the turbulence model, as I said, we need to study in literature. When whatever phenomenon, people have already done a lot of work in literature that this uh, turbulence model works for such uh, certain type of phenomenon and so on. Then we need to also uh, set the boundary conditions. Uh, for example, if we are studying a typical building with a computational domain, then we need to actually set the inlet boundary condition. We have to set the outlet boundary conditions, if the inlet is velocity boundary condition, for example, we need to set the outlet, for example, maybe uh, pressure uh, boundary conditions, we need to set the uh, ground roughness uh, uh, terrain and so on. So all these are boundary conditions that we need to set. Uh, then we need to initialize the solution. This initialization is very important. Initialization actually will uh, check all the boundary condition, all the data, that you set in the CFD software or program, whether it's correct or not. So what it does is it actually tell you that there is a problem with the setup of the uh, of the sub, uh, of the uh, model, or there is no problem. You can proceed. There are so many ways of uh, uh, actually uh, playing with this uh, initialization of uh, softwares. There are a lot of uh, settings like under relaxation factors and so on that you set uh, to actually uh, initialize. Uh, you set the also uh, the, uh, the from where to initialize from the inlet or from the outlet and so on. There are so many features uh, that one has to set when initializing the CFT. Then you calculate the solutions. When the solution need to combine because we, we need to uh, monitor the residuals. The residuals uh, monitoring actually, we, we actually uh, we need to set a combustion criteria. For example, in the best practice guideline that uh, uh, that was uh, established by uh, Yoshiro Tominaga from Japan and uh, Bart Blocken from Eindhoven University in Netherlands, um, they give actually a different. Uh, for example, for momentum x y z momentum equations, they give 10 to, 10 to the power of minus six as the uh, convergence criteria when the residuals actually uh, 
reach uh, decay and reach up to 10 raised power of minus six, then it's, uh, it assumes that the solution uh, has converged and so on. Uh, also for others, they also give a different uh, criteria. So you need to decide on the criteria of convergence of this uh, simulation before you actually uh, even start. Uh, if the solution has com uh, not converged, then you need to modify the boundary conditions, especially the mesh. Usually one of the major problems or one of the major uh, factors that uh, stopping uh, solutions, CFD solution from convergence is the mesh problem. If you have skewed mesh, if you have uh, mesh that uh, costs uh, not uh, fine enough actually to replicate the phenomenon or to solve the phenomenon, to provide the required number of cells and uh, uh, not the, to calculate the phenomenon that you want to calculate. So we, we usually go back to the calculation solution and we refine our mesh or, and also uh, check other boundary conditions that we have set and uh, update everything. Then we run the solution again. If we eventually get this solution converged, then it is yes, then we, we need to check whether the solution is correct or not. Because the convergence does not mean the solution that we got from the CFD is correct. We need to now check the, the data that we receive, the outcome, the result, the output, the results that we got from this simulation, whether they are reasonable or not. So uh, if these results are correct or reasonable, uh, let me put it reasonable, uh, reasonable, then we actually stop the uh, simulation and we get our data. Uh, uh, various uh, CFD software, they have uh, pre-processing, processing as post-processing. The post-processing, uh, for example, uh, uh, in ANSYS uh, workbench, we have a post-processing uh, software that you actually use it to process the results, the, the output that you got from the, uh, it's called CFD post, for example, is in, in ANSYS. And different uh, softwares also have different uh, post-processing softwares. So you can be able to uh, visualize the solution. You can be able to uh, get both qualitative and quantitative data actually uh, from this post-processing softwares that are available, uh, mostly integrated into this software. So this is more or less, uh, uh, this is the, uh, the typical process of simulation, uh, building simulation in CFD. There are other things, uh, it depends on this, but these are the main, these are the core, these are the things that actually uh, combine uh, almost every type of simulation, we need to actually uh, follow this uh, this process. Uh, perhaps uh, there are so many other types of simulation that have uh, some other uh, uh, some other actually uh, steps, uh, but this type of simulation are not uh, the majority. That's why this is actually representative of the most of the simulation that we do uh, are using uh, CFD uh, simulation. Uh, flow field uh, requirement. Uh, this is also another issue that differentiates the co-engineering uh, CFD simulation with the uh, uh, built environment uh, CFD simulation. In co-engineering CFD simulation, because most of the simulation that has to do with smooth surfaces like pipe and so on, the, 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 this, the engineering uses actually aeronautics uh, boundary uh, uh, profile. But for, uh, for wind engineering, because we want to replicate the atmospheric boundary layer, uh, our own actually is used wind engineering, the building uh, use wind, which is the one in the right, built in the, uh, because maybe those aeronautics are those that simulate maybe uh, movement of aeroplane in the sky. Aeroplane moves actually in very far away from the ground. So there is no effects of uh, roughness terrain in the ground, the buildings, the mountains, the population, our vehicles, all this, what we created within the earth surface do, do not actually affect the movement of aeroplane at that level. So, but when it, that's why uh, the mean velocity is uniform. As you can see, it is straight line for the aeronautics uh, uh, flow field. But if you are also, uh, the turbulence is low because there are no much disturbances actually at this level. But when it comes to building uh, simulation, wind engineering, uh, the mean velocity, uh, the lateral homogeneity is there because uh, 
we need to see, make it similar to the atmospheric boundary layer. Uh, how the atmospheric boundary layer looks, because there are a lot of rough terrain near the ground, be it buildings, be it mountains, be it trees, shrubs, be it whatever that we place on surface of the earth, they actually disturb the free flow of air on this surface of the earth. So that is why we need to actually create a logarithmic scale that can be able to take care of this phenomenon. That's why in the second wind engineering one you see, the velocity, the y actually is velocity, uh, the velocity, the mean velocity uh, increases with height and decreases uh, also uh, uh, as it uh, goes near the ground because uh, it assumes that there are a lot of uh, rough surfaces that can disturb the free movement of the, of the air. So that is why uh, whenever we are simulating a building, for example, we need to replicate how the building lives because uh, building lives in the world and the world actually is the big domain. So if you can see in this uh, diagram, you see there is a big domain. This big domain is called the computational domain. We have also the smaller domains. If you see like a city or some buildings at the center, this is actually uh, the test uh, section and this is uh, the building that we want to test. And you will see the uh, velocity profile uh, at the inlet location, at the approach location when the air is approaching the model that we created at the center and also velocity uh, profile at the incident location. Uh, it is necessary we get homogeneous uh, velocity profile. If the velocity profile in the inlet location, an approach location, an incident location, are not homogeneous, they are different, then there is a problem with our simulation. And there, is, there will be a problem in the output or outcome that we will eventually get from this simulation. So uh, you will see uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the inlet plane is the, where the air actually starts moving. And then the outlet is where the air eventually leaves the domain. And this domain is divided into the downstream part of the domain, the central, and then the upstream part of the domain. There are so many uh, uh, guidelines, uh, best practice guidelines, actually. Uh, one of the best practice guidelines is uh, this one. Uh, if you look at the domain, in order not to allow the uh, walls of the domain to interfere uh, with the uh, fluid flow within the domain, uh, it is required that uh, from the inlet to the test section, you must have 5H. H is the height height of the buildings. So the height of this building is H. So you must get five times the height of the building. Uh, from the uh, top of the building to the uh, ceiling of the computer domain, also you need to get uh, 6H. Uh, to the both side, you need to get 5H. And in order to avoid uh, uh, back siphonage of uh, flow uh, from the outlet, you need uh, 15 uh, actually H uh, from the uh, uh, site of the outlet. So this is a best practice guideline that is being used in the simulation in so many domains. Uh, one of the major issue when it comes to simulation is setting uh, boundary conditions. Boundary conditions define the input of the simulation model. So any simulation model, whether at the material level, whether at the building level, whether at the component or system level, whether at the uh, urban level, you need to set some conditions, physical boundary conditions and non-physical boundary conditions. So these are input that the software will understand and will actually use to simulate. Some conditions like velocity and volumetric flow rate define how fluid enters or leaves the model because uh, maybe we have the fluid flow in a context that we want to simulate for the Haran or for Riyadh. Then we need to get the inlet uh, air flow uh, similar to the airflow of the Haran or airflow of Riyadh, because we are mimicking, we are replicating the actual human environment so that we will get results similar to what if we could have done it in the full scale measurement of existing buildings. 
Uh, other conditions uh, like uh, film coefficients and heat flux, uh, especially uh, that has to do with envelopes or even materials, define the interchange of energy between the model and its surrounding environment. Because sometimes we want to uh, simulate uh, the heat transfer from outdoor to the indoor and so on. So we need to actually set these parameters. We need to set the outdoor parameter for the material actually to uh, assimilate uh, the indoor parameters and so on. Uh, this is, uh, this uh, diagram shows uh, some of the uh, boundary conditions that we do usually set to the computational domain. We set a velocity inlet boundary conditions. We set the symmetric boundary conditions, which are the uh, top, the sides. Uh, boundary. We have, we also set no slip wall, uh, boundary condition, especially uh, to the uh, bottom of the domain. And we also uh, set uh, usually pressure outlet, but this is also, again, it depends on the simulation and it depends on what phenomenon and what is being, uh, uh, it changes actually, even outlets uh, at times, the uh, velocity outlet is being set also. Also the inlet also, pressure inlet can be set also. So this is just an example, uh, but this is not, uh, uh, not intact, but it, ch it, it changes with what really the research I want to simulate, I want to get from this. Uh, there are uh, so many sources of errors in CFD simulation uh, because uh, CFD is one of the research methodology that has the highest uh, uh, simulation that we have. So that is why we need to recognize this simulation and we need to make sure that we actually uh, consider this uh, effect of this simulation in whatever outcome that the CFD will produce. Some of these we have physical modeling errors. Uh, this uh, we have uh, uh, computer roundup errors. We have iteration convergence errors. We have discretization errors. Uh, we have uh, computer programming errors. Uh, to start uh, with the physical modeling errors, uh, Due to uncertainty in the formulation of the model and to deliberate uh, simplification of the model, example, employing the Reynolds average Navier stock or if, uh, equations in the combination with a given turbulence model, whatever types of turbulence model that we selected, K epsilon, K omega, or whatever. The eddy viscosity model or Bousnet hypothesis also, how we set the Bousnet hypothesis. Uh, Bousnet hypothesis uh, is that. Uh, the turbulent stress is related to the mean velocity gradient in, uh, in, in always the same way that the viscous stress are related to the complete velocity gradient. So uh, this is uh, what we want to replicate by using the Bousnet approximation uh, or hypothesis. Uh, the use of specific uh, constant in the K epsilon, we have the Prandtl and we have different constant of the K, K epsilon or K omega or whatever uh, turbulence model that we want to use. Uh, also, the use of wall functions. As I said earlier, wall functions are equations empirically derived uh, and used to satisfy the phys uh, physics in the near wall region. So we always uh, get a lot of problems in replicating the near wall uh, treatment of uh, computational uh, uh, simulation. So that is why uh, to, to take care of this, we always use uh, settings in the near wall functions. The modeling of surface roughness also is very important. What is the roughness terrain? What are the heights of the buildings around the building that we are simulating? Are they buildings with the same height with the building that we are simulating? Are they buildings that are lower in height to the building that we are simulating? Are they buildings that are twice the height of the building that we are simulating? Or oh, are there are the surrounding is the empty space like airport and so on without any building but with just shrubs and trees around? So these are some of the things that we need to. Uh, simplification of geometry of the model also is one of the physical modeling errors, because, uh, for example, if you are simulating building, you need to simplify issues like window seals and so on, things uh, designs on the surfaces and so on. At times, these designs on the surfaces of building actually also affect the flow and affect the phenomenon that we are, we, we are modeling. So these kind of errors are all summed up and it's called physical modeling errors. And this is modeling as a result of maybe ignorance by the uh, 
person that is doing the simulation because they, they lack the knowledge or as a result of the uh, system or court error from the CFD court that it's being used. So there is no turbulent model that is universally uh, valid, but physical modeling errors can be examined by performing validation studies. So we can use any of the turbulence model at the end of the day, but uh, when we need to actually conduct a validation study. CFD without validation study is not acceptable anymore. We need to conduct a validation study. Computer roundup errors. This is actually a common error that happens in not only CFD, in many other uh, simulation that has to do with uh, computer. Uh, roundup errors are not uh, considered significant when compared with other errors. But if they are uh, suspected to be significant, one can perform a test by running the code at a higher precision. So you need to increase the, pre if you are rounding up to two or three, then you need to actually increase the precision to see whether there is a problem of round of errors or not. Iteration convergence error. This is very important and this is errors. Sometimes uh, when you are conducting CFD simulation and you set the uh, convergence criteria, for example, as I said, the momentum criteria to the 10 raised power of minus six, uh, for example, K and epsilon, let's assume you are using K epsilon turbulent model, K and epsilon, you set it to maybe 10 to the power of minus uh, uh, pi, for example, and you set the energy temperature equation to 10 to the power of minus six and, uh, and so on. Then uh, sometimes, uh, even if you leave the simulation to one week, you will not get the convergence and they will not reach completely and converge. But at certain distance, uh, at certain level, you need to just assume that uh, the solution converges. But sometimes it depends on the phenomenon, it depends on how you handle your mesh it depends on how you set your boundary condition, the solution actually converge. So this error is introduced because the iterative procedure has to be stopped at a certain time. When the, uh, the simulation did not stop naturally, then you need to stop the simulation at a certain time. So this stoppage of the simulation at a certain time, there are two things involved. It could be that the simulation has converged already, or it could be that it is near to converge, but it, could, it didn't uh, converge actually. So iteration convergence error can be estimated. So we need to estimate the convergence error to see that uh, this, uh, the, the output or the outcome that we receive from the simulation is not being affected by the convergence error actually of the simulation. Discretization error. Discretization error is also a very important error because as I said in the previous, uh, slice that um, CFD uses the knots and the cells that we actually provided in the volume of fluid to calculate a, a, the phenomenon that we want to uh, uh, replicate. So discretization errors are generated from representing the governing equations and the equations of the turbulence model on the mesh. These are the knots and the cells that represent a discretized computational domain. For unsteady calculation also, the time discretization causes discretization error. So if it is unsteady also, there is a time discretization that also contributes to discretization error. This type of error is also called a numerical error. Uh, grid sensitivity analysis is a minimum requirement in a CFD simulation. Uh, CFD simulation sometimes is actually sensitive to grid because sometimes the grids are the mesh are the cells, are the knots that we actually produce in the volume that we want to simulate. So sometimes, for example, we have 1 million cells as a grid. Sometimes we have 1.5 million. Sometimes we have 2 million. Some simulation, maybe you have 10 million and so on. So how do you know that this grid, number of grids are enough? So usually for us to strike a balance between our computational power and grid number of grid, we conduct what we call grid sensitivity analysis. Grid sensitivity analysis is that you actually test different sizes of grids. For example, you start with 1 million grids, you test uh, 1.5 million, 2 million, 2.5. What you will do is you need to check at which level the grids actually uh, is not sensitive to the outcome, the results that you get. So whenever it comes that when, even when you change the grid or increase the grid, grid uh, uh, 
the, 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 the outcome, the result does not react actually to the changes in the grid, then at this time you need to stop and you choose the lower grid that actually will save you some computational power. In this case, you have that already done your grid sensitivity test and this grid is not sensitive to actually uh, uh, changes. Uh, this uh, study, I mean, is not sensitive to the changes in the grid uh, sizes, uh, as I said. So for example, here we have different types of grid, uh, you know, A, B, C, and this grid actually, uh, if you see grid number C is really a fine grid compared to grid number A and grid number B. So uh, it is started, for, for example, uh, also in the bottom one, if you see D, E, and F, if you see F is finer compared to E and also compared to D. So if you are conducting a grid sensitivity test, you have to simulate uh, phenomenon A. They are the same model, but only the difference is that the size of grid differs and B and C. If you are simulating A, actually you need a very small computational power compared to C because of the grid size. Uh, so uh, you, you test until you get that the difference between the first grid and the second grid and the third grid is not less, uh, it's very less or negligible or uh, additional grid does not change the outcome of the result. Then you will actually go for the lower grid so that you are, you are very sure now that the grid uh, size is, uh, uh, is actually acceptable and does not affect the outcome of your study. The last, uh, the final uh, uh, possible error is the comp computer programming errors. Programming errors are mistakes made in writing the computer code. This type of errors can be discovered by systematically performing verification studies and validation studies and by comparing the results of the code with those of similar code. If you have, for example, ANSYS, you will maybe simulate using maybe COMSOL and you also simulate maybe using uh, SimScale and so on, then you can be able to know why. If there are two simulation engines that have the same result and the other one is different or three have the same result and other one is different, then definitely there is a code error in the third one that provide different results actually and so on. So these are actually the code errors. These validation studies, validation study, many errors are made by CFD users due to lack of knowledge. Because CFD is a software that uh, you cannot be able to know everything about it. You can only, be, one can only be able to understand and know the areas of interest of CFD. If you are part of in building simulation, you will know everything that has to do with building simulation. And when it comes to maybe uh, simulation of aeronautics or aeroplane, then you actually your knowledge is limited and so on. So because CFD is very huge, there is also a, a very uh, a huge opportunity of making uh, errors and mistakes due to lack of knowledge uh, uh, of the terminologies or lack of knowledge of the settings or lack, lack of knowledge of phenomena, or lack of knowledge of so many things actually. As a result, CFD uh, simulation result can only be trusted or used when or if they have been performed on a mesh obtained by grid sensitivity analysis. So any CFD simulation that does not actually uh, subject the mesh to grid sensitivity analysis is not acceptable. So this is one criteria. The second criteria is they have been performed, taking an, uh, into account the proper guidelines that have been published in literature. That's why I said, if you go to literature, you will find a lot of guidelines. Very famous guideline I said is one that is developed by Tominaga uh, and also those that developed by Bloch uh, uh, and Statopoulos and so on. There are so many uh, actually best practice guidelines and these guidelines, uh, were arrived based on so many studies and so many research and so on. So this guideline has to be also respected. They have been also carefully validated. You have to validate this. So any simulation, any CFD simulation this day has to be validated. You have to validate either using a reduced scale like a wind tunnel measurement or full scale measurement result. So if we, the, and then the error margin between the reduced scale or the validation uh, must be not more than 15 uh, 15 although some or some some studies also say 20 percent is also acceptable but uh, to be in safer side the difference between 
the full scale measurement or the reduced scale measurement and the CFD simulation should not go beyond 15%. This is the error margin, the most acceptable error margin in this, uh, in this field. Validation actually denotes systematically comparing, as I said, CFD result with experiment to assess the performance of the physical modeling alternative. So you have an experiment, you did it either in wind tunnel, reduced scale or full scale. Now you compare it and you can be able to know uh, whether uh, the CFD is uh, performing a very good job. Or not. Validation typically focuses on certain models and or certain uh, application example, performance of the turbulence model, like K epsilon model in predicting wind flow around building. We can be able to validate this by full scale measurement and so on. The validity of turbulence model for different applications. Uh, this is also if the turbulence model is uh, very good uh, for maybe uh, uh, simulating uh, particulate matter, maybe it will be maybe very poor in simulating ventilation or it will be very poor in uh, simulating maybe fire, for example, and so on. So we can also validate across actually uh, different applications of the CFD. Uh, grid quality and discretization scheme, this is very important. This is a core of CFD simulation. If one did not get the grid very well, then the, it will affect the entire result. Various types of control volumes or cells can be used when you are using, uh, you have triangle or quadrilateral cells. Uh, this could be transformed into tetrahedron, hexahedron, prism or wedge or pyramid, uh, actually uh, cells. Mostly people use uh, hexahedron, tetrahedron, uh, actually meshed uh, in simulation. So uh, this is very important to decide what type of cell that we want to use uh, in our simulation. Also the shape of the cell is very important. The general guideline, uh, try to avoid extreme distortion of cells. Example, uh, cells that are skewed less than 90 degrees, you know, uh, for, uh, for triangles. This actually will co cause truncation errors in, 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 the, in, the, in this. For example, if you see the cells in the, in the left, these are very good cells because most of the angles are bigger. And also the one in the, center is also acceptable. But if you see the one uh, at the right, uh, there is a very skewed uh, cells that are very, very uh, small, less than 90 degree uh, angles and so on. And this one also, uh, the parallel lines, uh, the distance between is very small. So it's very difficult to get a knot and, uh, and, and cells to actually uh, cover this very small uh, phenomenon which even if you want to get it, maybe you need to, you need a very huge computational power and so on. So try to- I'm, I'm at the, yes. just uh, watch uh, at the time. Uh, How have, many minutes I have? You have uh, maybe another five minutes. Yeah, okay, sure. I will complete within the five minutes. Uh, cell type distribution is also very important. Uh, first grid lines the, uh, near the wall should preferably be parallel because uh, this is the major problem we face, especially in the near wall treatment. So some of these turbulence models, as I said, they don't replicate or they don't uh, uh, model a near wall treatment very well. So the first grid near the wall of uh, the model should preferably be parallel to the wall. Use quadrilateral, this is best practice, or hexahedral, as I said, or prism with cells in the first actually uh, cells near the uh, wall. Uh, to avoid truncation uh, truncation errors. This is uh, just in the right, if you see uh, the one, uh, it, the first one, it uses uh, parallel cells near the wall. The, one, the other one, it uses actually a kind of wedges uh, near the cells. So we need to use parallel as much as possible to avoid uh, a poor actually uh, replication of the phenomenon near wall, uh, in the near wall. Grid resolution is also very important and should be higher in regions where large uh, flow gradient are expected, especially if you have a phenomenon or model. Uh, there are some, if, for example, if you are modeling natural ventilation in buildings. What, what is the major uh, phenomenon that you want to measure is the window, is the opening space, because you want to model how the opponent actually uh, invite air from the outside and how it circulate and move from the outlet. So you need to actually uh, provide higher resolutions in terms of grid 
near the window because this is the most important phenomenon that we want to model and we want to simulate. So this is, uh, this is very important. The resolution should be higher in regions of interest. That's what I'm saying. Regions of interest is that the, in natural ventilation, I said like in the uh, windows. A local grid refinement should be employed, especially in the regions of main interest when systematic global refinement of the grid is unfeasible. If you could be able, if you uh, refine the grid globally, then it will increase the computational power that you require for the simulation. So that is why you need to actually uh, uh, only refine in the region of uh, uh, interest uh, since the global uh, uh, refinement is not feasible uh, due to the huge computational power that is owing to limitation in computational power. Maybe the computer you are using or system is actually has limitation in computational power. When determining mesh resolution, a compromise between accuracy of the outcome of your result and the computational power should be handled very wisely. Do not actually uh, really wish the quality of your outcome uh, to actually uh, computational power of your computer. This is uh, very important. To ensure that simulation results are not sensitive to grid, the grid independence is very essential. So for example, in this diagram, you see at this center, this center is actually uh, an area of uh, interest and you see how it is being refined compared to other bigger uh, facade you know of the uh, envelope uh, that is being uh, modeled so this is an uh, example actually of uh, discretization scheme i have uh, five minutes i think this is uh, maybe i have two or uh, one slice discretization scheme discretization schemes or discretization methods are used to slice a continuous function into discrete functions because the volume that we are simulating, whether it is a space or a material or a building, it is actually continuous. It is a continuous volume of air. It's a continuous volume of fluid. But now for us to actually slice this continuous function into discrete function, uh, then we need actually to employ this characterization scheme. Why the solution values are defined at each point in space and time? Because we can be able to define the the, 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 the solution values in terms of the knot, in terms of the point, and we also can be able to take into cognizance the time actually constraint of the solution. This characterization simply refers to the spacing between each point in the solution space. If you look at this diagram that I just showed, you see these uh, different knots at the center is P. You see to the north, we have also another knot to the west, to the east, and to the uh, south. And also, uh, you can see also, you can be able to get uh, the delta y, which is change difference between the two knots actually, and also delta x and so on. So we can be able to calculate a phenomenon within this actual cells and so on. Uh, second order schemes should always be used because in the discretization scheme, we have the first order schemes and we also have uh, second order schemes and so on. So second order scheme is the discretization uh, uh, scheme that is most acceptable in any simulation. Uh, anything less than this, for example, ASME, Journal of Fluid Engineering, does not publish a result from first order approximation. If you use first order schemes, they don't even uh, uh, decide to publish your paper. Second order scheme uh, will, uh, will, uh, will, uh, will easier uh, lead to uh, divergence than first order scheme. Because if you use first order scheme, then you cannot get a divergent result. The divergent result means your phenomenon is not correct, your boundary condition is not correct, your cells are not right, and so on. So if you use uh, first order scheme, which means even if you have incorrect uh, boundary condition, you can be able to achieve in one way or the other uh, as convergence of simulation, and you will get a very poor or wrong result. That's why this type of scheme is not acceptable, especially uh, uh, for less quality grids. Uh, and also uh, at times use the first order solution for initialization. For, for example, at times we can use the first order solution just to initialize the result, uh, the, 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 the simulation. Then for the proper calculation, we can now use the second order uh, simulation. Iterative, uh, iter iterative convergence. Uh, in many commercial CFD uh, codes, limit for convergence are too linear. Measure to convergence, uh, scale residuals, uh, measure of unbalance in governing the equation. So the convergence are actually measures of unbalance in 
and the governance equation that we use for the simulation. General guidelines, when convergence is expected to have been attained, check if the solution changes significantly between this and the next one to the iteration. Because in the cases that the, uh, the simulation did, did not stop, uh, or even after it has stopped, you can be able to add 1,000 more uh, iteration, and you can be able to compare the result between the previous, uh, before the uh, 1,000 iteration and after the 1,000 iteration, just to check whether the result changes with more similar uh, iterations or not. Do not trust uh, guidelines for uh, residual threshold that I said 10 to the power of minus six and so on. It depends highly on initialization because we can play with our initialization uh, with, with, um, uh, on the relaxation factor even to achieve the uh, convergence uh, with actually uh, uh, less reliable outcome. So this is a typical example of residuals from the CFD simulation. If you see the diagram, showing the momentum equations, the uh, energy equations, the turbulence equations, and so on. And uh, it is uh, clearly uh, de 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 depreciating actually toward uh, convergence. Thank you very much uh, for listening and thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed, for the presentation and on the CFD and building simulation. Uh, let's move to the Q&A session. And uh, uh, I don't uh, see question. One question is regarding uh, where can the recording be found? Uh, I think so Kix uh, will make the recording available after some time. And uh, we can give you the link. And from that uh, link, you can uh, take the uh, you can listen to this uh, lecture again. And uh, there is another uh, question from Albora Ahilias. Is there, uh, I don't see the question over there. If anybody has any question, he can uh, raise his hand. Uh, Dr. Walid Al Aosh is asking uh, about the modeling of hollow block. If I want to model the heat transfer through masonry wall by solar radiation, which type of flow will be inside the cavities? Laminar or uh, And which type uh, of air shall I select? Yeah, actually, if you are using uh, solar radiation, we also have a solar radiation model in the CFD simulation, especially commercial softwares of CFD simulation. Uh, we have different models. We have the do models. We have ray tracing models. We have different, actually, four or five. Uh, I cannot be able to remember all of them. Uh, solar radiation, uh, apart from uh, uh, using the uh, turbulence equations and the uh, turbulence model, you need to also uh, own the solar radiation. You know, you need to also own the solar radiation for you to actually. Uh, uh, replicate the actual phenomenon in terms of radiation. So uh, if you are using uh, this uh, mercenary to simulate solar radiation, you definitely need to, uh, and you say which type of flow will be inside the cavities, lamina and turbulent flow. Ah, uh, this is actually, uh, it depends. Uh, uh, usually inside the cavities are uh, turbulent, uh, sorry, uh, lamina flows, uh, but in case, if you have uh, an envelope that has an air gap and you are also ventilating the space, then there is a huge possibility of also getting a turbulent flow. But in the normal uh, envelope, uh, usually we have a lamina flow. So, and which type of air shall I select uh, ideal gas or suitable? Yeah, you can select the ideal gas actually for such kind of simulation. Okay. But make sure that uh, you also own the uh, radiation equation and you also set the different types of the radiation that you want to. There are different approximations of radiation that are available in CFD. You need to choose one based on the phenomenon. Uh, this is actually radiation is similar to the uh, uh, turbulence model that we said uh, it depends on near world treatment and so on. Also, it depends on the phenomenon that you want to uh, simulate. Okay, next question is uh, Dr. Hussein al Qahtani. If I wanted to model carbon dioxide storage, which model should I use? Uh, actually, uh, if you want to say, simulate in CO2, 
in CFD is uh, not straightforward because you need to use the species, species transport. And in the species, you need to actually get the atoms of carbon, one atom and two atoms of oxygen. So if you add to these two to your system as a species, then you can, it can, definitely the CFD software will actually recognize these two atoms of uh, carbon and uh, one, two oxygen and uh, one atom of, uh, atom of carbon uh, as what as a CO2 actually, and it can uh, simulate, uh, you can get the CO2. So you need to use the species. There is a species uh, that you can actually set the species in the CFD model. Okay, uh, Mahmoud, uh, Ms. Job is asking how can CFD be applied for indoor quality and environments and the rate of uh, VOCs entering the indoor? Price? Yeah, usually when we, when we want to uh, calculate or model uh, indoor air quality and environment, we usually use uh, the uh, discrete uh, discrete uh, particulate matters. And these uh, discrete models, uh, there are two types, these discrete models. Uh, either it is the Lagrangian models or the Eulerian models. If you use the Lagrangian model, for example, you can be able to uh, simulate the, uh, uh, the movement of a particular particles or particular uh, phenomenon or VOC or chemical within the space that you are simulating. If you, you, uh, if you use the Eulerian model, the Euler uh, cannot be able to give you uh, the trajectory of a particular uh, contaminant, but it can be able to give you the, the whole uh, sum of the contaminant within the space uh, and time. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Mohamed al -Osta. Yes, uh, Salaam Alaikum. Uh, I don't have any question uh, rather than I would like to thank you, Dr. Kaleem, and our distinguished speaker, Dr. Muhammad, and all the uh, respected uh, attendees. Uh, and also, I will not forget the cakes for the organization this uh, event. Uh, it was a really a great pleasure to listen and learn so much from the topic that, that Dr. Muhammad presented. And I will take this uh, opportunity to thank you on behalf the, uh, of the our IRC CBM. Uh, inshallah, I would, it will be our pleasure to invite you uh, again uh, uh, around the same uh, subject uh, in the near future. And thank, thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Very much. Um, and uh, uh, we don't have uh, any more questions. Time is also uh, almost uh, finished. So uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Muhammad Laji Muhammad, for this uh, very informative presentation regarding uh, modeling aspects of uh, buildings uh, using uh, CFD. And in a future seminar or webinar, we'd like to have uh, to see some applications which you have done. Uh, for buildings uh, uh, using ANSYS or any other software. Sure. Uh, also, I mean, uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Mahmoud al Osta and uh, the team uh, for the kicks who have made this possible in a very short time. And also, finally, to all the attendees of this uh, webinar, thank you for coming and joining. And don't forget to give your feedback uh, in the survey form, which will come to you. And uh, also uh, we will meet again next month and, and most probably in the second, third or fourth week of May on, on another topic. And uh, Dr. Mohammed, if you'd like to say something. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. So we'll uh, end the seminar now.